Welcome to episode four of The Reading Cure. In this episode, we'll be discussing the play Butley by Simon Gray. Welcome to The Reading Cure where we discuss how great books can help us to live wiser and more fulfilling lives. I'm Dr Stephen Davis and my co-host is Dr Alexander Fox. This week we're looking at the play Butley by Simon Gray, which depicts a tragicomic day of disaster in the life of a brilliant but painfully self-destructive English lecturer. The title character, Ben Butley, is a sharp-witted but reckless T.S. Eliot scholar, a middle-aged man in crisis and alcohol fueled denial who loses his wife, daughter, close friend, colleague, possibly male lover, all on the same day. It's an almost archetypal depiction of brilliant talent gone horribly awry and raises intriguing questions about how talented and intelligent people can better maintain their sense of contentment and stability which can at times be unnervingly precarious, even in potentially fulfilling lines of work, such as academia. Now, we're specifically recommending a seminal performance of the play, which was recorded for film and is free to watch on YouTube. Uh, We have links to this performance in the show notes, and we'd highly recommend it, although it's not necessary to watch before listening to the podcast. Um, This incredible performance stars the late Alan Bates, a masterful English character actor who had a prolific career in theatre, and it was directed by the playwright Simon Gray's close friend and contemporary Harold Pinter, himself a Nobel Prize winning playwright of international acclaim. So this really is an all-star production of this play, which brings an unforgettable protagonist most vividly to life. Now, just before we begin our discussion, I just wanted to highlight that for anyone interested in supporting the podcast, we're now set up on Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee. Uh, Links to these are on our website, thereadingcure.com. So if you do like what you hear, um, any support you'd like to give will, of course, be a great help to us in sustaining the podcast and would be hugely appreciated. So the first question uh, tonight, Alec, that we're going to discuss um, is about Butley himself. Um, so he's obviously he's a very distinctive character. Um, so I'm wondering how how would you define or explain his kind of main personality traits? Do you think? Yeah, I was I was thinking about this. I mean, this is clearly a a fascinating and complicated man. And I, and I was thinking about what two colleagues had said to me once that had watched the Alan Bates version. One colleague had said that he he would have found Butley to be this irritating, selfish colleague, and certainly he would not have wanted to share an office with him <laughs> in I academia. Think so, no. <laughs> That's what one colleague said. Sure. And then another colleague had said that Butley was like a man in a desert and, and there was nothing to drink. Hmm. And when I was thinking about it... Um, in a sense, a, a, a truer conception of this character is bringing those two views together because they both have a, a truth to them. I, I don't think it's possible with this character to write a, you know, a glowing tribute or a, dra- a damning verdict about him because he is that complicated. Both of them have a point, I think, and it would be teasing that out in what way that... Um, he was both selfish and brilliant and unfulfilled. I think that's a kind of key thing when we think about his personality. But yeah, if if, if we were just talking about it from the the most basic level, what 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 sticks out, I think, regarding Butley is 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 his eloquence, is articulously. Um, you, you know, he loves words, he caresses words, he also uses them as weapons more often than not. To, to be honest, so yep, what what would strike me or probably most people uh, when first encountering him is how articulate he is. And um, that that would be the first personality trait that, that would strike me, I think, in most people. Uh, when when sorry, I think you were about to say something. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I was I was going to I was going to agree very much. I think you're right. He, I mean, he, he hits you in the face when you watch the the play. Um, the the you know we're, you're hit by this kind of extreme combination of abrasiveness, sometimes childish antagonism, and yeah, great kind of verbosity. You know, this very brilliant, uh, but very 
intense man who's clearly uh, in a kind of damaged state. Um, I, I was going to just throw in, there was a really nice quote from the, the play's director, Harold Pinter, about Butley. Um, he said that the, the play gives us a character who hurls himself towards destruction while living in the fever of his intellectual hell with a vitality and brilliance known to few of us. And I thought that kind of captures really the the, the extremes of, of talent and um, damage and hostility, really, that yeah. he sort of presents yeah. us with. I think it does. The fever of his intellectual hell is a very good expression because this is a character that is unfortunately alienated by his strengths, alienated by his brilliance. And a symptom of that, if we want to put it in that way, is his how, how articulate he is. The level in which he's talking, you know, the speed, the dexterity, the complexity of what he says, uh, shows, as psychologists would say, uh, a tremendous openness to experience. But it is so, there's such dexterity that uh, who could keep up, who could follow him in that way. So there is, there is a there is an alienation that comes, unfortunately, from that, that, uh, that strength. That is part of his predicament, unfortunately. A strength is a weakness there. Um, I, th- I, think I think also, sorry. Sorry, yeah, no, and it was just to add. I think I think one of the things that's maybe sometimes difficult for people, you know, you're talking about your your um, you know colleague who yeah. who hadn't particularly liked Butley as a person. Yes, you know, you know in the nature of this place, we're seeing him on a day, a day where everything has gone absolutely catastrophically yes. wrong. He's badly hung over. He's drunk for part of the play. So we're, we're in some ways you're having to actually infer his better qualities from what you do see. But True. but clearly he's not on his best behaviour in this play. You know, he's 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 clearly been a gifted and inspiring lecturer actually at one time and that is that's something that's mentioned but you're not really seeing him playing that part on on that particular day no. so i think that's probably no. also I, th- I think that's uh i think that's a very good point and i think it's also very compassionate to keep that in mind that we are seeing uh this character at the end game of how he's been behaving of his antics in some way. Not that we want to say it's all, almost entirely down to him, but uh, it does seem, as Pinter himself said, that he was on this self-destructive path. And placing or, or uncovering, it, to be more accurate, what that's to do with is central, I think, to understanding him and the play. And, and I think that there is a degree of immaturity. I know that's quite a judgmental word, but I think there is a a degree of immaturity in Butley. We've got someone that is, to some extent, and I'm not going to say completely because there are important qualifications to this, to some extent emotionally immature. Intellectually brilliant, but emotionally immature in some ways. Um, The immaturity, I think, has got a lot to do with that this this character is a morbid fear of dependence, a morbid fear of revealing his vulnerability. And and he covers it up. Unfortunately, because he's so eloquent, he can cover it up with words. And he is rarely um, candid about how he really feels. Alan Bates does a brilliant job in conveying uh, the actual feelings of this character, which are which are quite passionate and uh, sensitive, but hardly ever come into his words. His words are more sort of like playful interrogations. That's the paradox of the character is that it's, he's playfully interrogative. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I think that that does that definitely comes up. Um, I I wondered my, uh, about the you know uh, Butley um, is has has kind of regressed to sort of spouting nursery rhymes in a very kind of passive aggressive way. I, mm. I slightly wondered whether that was in a way him almost stating the level he thinks that others are operating at. You know, he he stopped giving them Elliot. He's now giving them these kind of barbed rhymes because it, you know almost as like a protest and a slightly imma- obviously a mature way that um, he's dissatisfied with them and this is kind of how. How he, what he feels that they're worth in some way. Um, I yeah, I, I, th- I think there's, uh, I think there's definitely some truth to that. His, his dedication, shall we put it, to nursery rhymes works on a number of levels. One of them, as you see, is a sort of protest uh, or an expression of his contempt of uh, academia, the absurdity of it. In some ways, that aspect of it reminded me of Reggie Pern. Um, okay. how he reacted in terms of feeling that his job had had a certain absurdity to it. And so he would start to 
play with it in various ways. I think Butley has that dimension with his focus on uh, yeah. nursery rhymes. But also it does capture a certain thing about his immaturity too, I think. that um, yeah. As I was watching the play, I, I just couldn't help but feel that um, in some ways he was reacting like this very bright kid that the other ones no longer want to play with <laughs> and <laughs> and that he was badgering them in some ways too. And and it and, and I'm not recognising that, that that sort of hostility, even if it's done playfully, is going to wear people down. Um, it, it's an interesting thing. It's, it, it's as if he can't do otherwise. It, it's what's in his emotional repertoire. And I suppose the ultimate criticism of that is that his wife and his flatmate choose people that are rather dull, but at oh. least dependable, at least more mature in some ways. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, that's a great point. I mean, that is like the ultimate insult to Butler. You know, I think at one point he makes some some um you know derogatory comment about students you know and he says something he, he uses some expletive and he says that's my you know affectionate way for describing bores you know and it's yes, like that's yeah, the worst the yeah. worst sin for him so well yeah, yes it is so, it so is. i mean i i guess yeah the the idea that he you know and obviously as you say there's this there's this kind of immaturity in the way in the way that he deals with this but he you know rightly feels himself to be a talented guy and yes, he's not yeah. only been not appreciated he's actually been ditched twice for people that are dull unoriginal this yeah. is absolutely the pits and so i guess it's no wonder you know the degree of kind of vindictiveness in him you know he he <laughs> he says to his wife you know are you going to make trouble and he says i'll i'll make trouble all right you know this is the only bit of our marriage i'm going to enjoy you know yeah. he's really bitter um, you know, mean, mean spirited comments are coming out of him because he's been so cut to the to the quick, really. I guess by what's what's happened well, to him. Yes, yeah. I mean, he he has been. It is true that he has been neglected by strains, alienated by them. Uh, that that that's for sure. As we as we spoke about earlier on, but I think also there is that immaturity there that Butley doesn't seem to be able to understand or at least acknowledge that uh, intellectual brilliance is not everything and there's other kinds of maturity too and I mean so it's quite narcissistic of him to to label people that that weren't as smart as him as brilliant as him as bores uh, but that that's that's I mean, you know, I'm going to use that tired old phrase, but that that's his inferiority complex they're acting <laughs> out. That, that he has to he has to smear them as bores because uh, he doesn't want to acknowledge. I think that they may be uh, superior in other ways. Uh, being brilliant doesn't mean to say you're going to be a good partner. Well, uh, indeed. I mean, one thing that occurred to me earlier, you mentioned, um, you know, Butley is this man who's high in openness experience, mm. you know, and, mm. uh, you know, I'm slightly having, I'm thinking about the, you know, the famous YouTuber, Dr. Dr. Grandy and how he, he yeah. likes to talk about his big five traits, you know, I guess yeah. Butley he would be low, extremely low on conscientiousness, you know, and these people that yeah. he sees as dull bores are probably people that are at least moderate, if not high on that. And again, that may not make you such as great a, a scholar on a particularly you know, a poetic topic, but you know, these are still legitimate strengths that he's obviously, you know, wanting to denigrate because it's, you know, it's the opposite well, in some ways. Yeah. Kind of, kind well, of absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's a great point that he is low in conscientiousness. And, and I think that again, um, the events in the play prove that to him with Edna getting her book out because Edna is the, is the plodding scholar, the dedicated, yep. um, maybe workaholic scholar. M no doubt, nowhere near as brilliant uh, inherently as, as Butley, but she has produced this book, A 20-Year Labour. And uh, it, so that event shows that conscientiousness can achieve things. In fact, she's achieved more than him, despite his, uh, shall we say, um, enviable gifts. 
Yep. And and he recognizes that. He recognizes that, but that sort of commitment and thoroughness is what he lacks. He, he's he's in some ways um he's in, in some ways uh almost a hysterical character of the moment of uh you know, almost too passionate and too taken over by his whims and his feelings to actually then sit down and dedicate himself to uh, an extended period of work or even a relationship, Yeah, to be honest. And and I think that he probably knows that he has that, um, that difficulty. And that's maybe why he's been seduced by having these close personal connections with uh, younger people, these students, where they could at least admire him. But the thing is that Joey, I mean, we isn't a great character as a person in some ways, but Joey at least has got to this post-admiration phase of Butley, and he wants more. He doesn't, want, he doesn't love the man that he's a way to go and live with, but he sees that still as better than being in Butley's orbit. And uh, so, in a way, there is that kind of um, stepping stone of maturity in some ways for Joey there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's 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 an interesting dynamic that Joey and Butley seem to have because obviously, to some extent, it's clear that Joey has kind of joined in with Butley a little bit in the past, yeah. you know, maybe in his um, humour about people that he, that Butley would see as bores and you know it's clear that that Joey has even actually made jokes about mm. the guy Reg that he's that he's now you know in a relationship with but but you can see like there was a there was a little quote I noted down actually from early on which is where early on where where Joey comes in and Butley empties out his his you know mangled briefcase on Joey's desk and he picks up a a thesis that he's not read and Joey says oh you've you've forgotten to give this student his thesis back and Butley says not yet so far I've forgotten to read it forgetting to give it back will come later failing Americans is a slow and intricate ritual and that's what they come here for yeah so it's like there's a but again Joey doesn't laugh at this and you know there's a sign that this kind of attitude of complete disdain you know to students and bores and whatever else is kind of wearing a bit thin with with joey now and it's like yeah, Butley doesn't know you know maybe doesn't really know how else to try and try and reach out in a way how else to try and maybe win him back yeah i mean i yeah. I, I get the impression yeah i think that's a good point i get i get the impression that that at one time joey as you said did indulge in laughing at other people, bores and so on. He was probably um, feeling great that this intellectually brilliant man had given him this attention and that they could laugh together at other people. As, as a young man, he probably found that very gratifying. But as he got older, he, 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 it's, it's probably got wearying, grating. Uh, in some way... I mean, in in some sense, despite the in, the intellectual brilliance, the the articulateness of Butley, the tone is maybe uh, too samey. The the tone of futility, of course, Joey refers to that about futility, and even if he is rather too focused on his promotion, he does have certain things he wants to achieve in life, and. So he's recognising that that sneering, but in action, you know, that that sneering that comes from uh, wallowing in futility is no longer useful to him. He's seen the background to the to the jokes, you know, Butley's jokes, and he recognises he doesn't want to get lost in that um, quicksand. He has things yeah. he wants to achieve. This maybe actually brings us on um, nicely to to another issue that I was yeah. hoping to discuss, which is all about the issue of of um, I guess you could say games. Yeah. Um, you know, J- Butley actually refers at various points in the play to the idea of playing games with Joey, other characters. Um, he says at one point to Joey, "Our games together have been growing rather stale." Perhaps Reg and I can invent some new ones, you know, slightly yeah. menacingly suggesting that you know yeah. he's going to interfere with Joey's yeah. new partner. But yeah. um, you know, this is this is this is what's striking about this is that Butley seems to just 
be in gameplay mode. Obviously, um, it's it was it struck me that actually the um, the famous um, Eric Byrne book about yeah. you know games people play. I think only actually came out maybe four or five years before this play was written. Yeah, and it's like there's lots of reference to this idea of playing games, but it you know and the idea that other people don't want to play Butley's games. You know, Joey included, Reg included. Um, so I thought it was it was interesting, maybe an issue to explore that. Um, what, what was your take? Do you think that? Do you think the Bern view about, you know, maybe about, you know, adult parent and child states and any of that is, is kind of relevant here to Butley? The way I see it is that the game playing for him is to some extent a symptom of uh, not wanting to be direct because he's got, as I said, he almost has this morbid fear of um, vulnerability and, and dependence. He does not want to show... Uh, how much he needs these people. I mean, it's it's so obvious, of course, that that uh, that he loves their company or he wants to be around, say, Joey. He can't even allow him to go out for a night um, with a partner. Uh, yeah. He's so needy in a sense, but he, he never directly says it. It's more covered over with eloquence and barbs and so on. But I see the game playing as a way of trying to achieve his goal which is you know bring these people back to him particularly joey but without really uh disclosing that vulnerability almost as though the i, I mean in some ways it's quite pinteresque you know the director harold pinter uh, uh, his plays have this that the characters will say a lot to obscure to how they really yeah. feel almost like um an octopus injecting dye into the water to hide themselves yeah, I think that, you know, that's a very good observation there, um, Alec, because there, there's a really nice little, um, can, if I can hit you with another quote, which I think this one's yeah. quite funny. Joey gives a narration of when he introduced Butley to Reg for the first time. Yeah. And, you know, I think this just highlights what you were just describing about the kind of covert strategies. And, you know, uh, Joey says, on your, your one meeting, you pretended you thought he was Australian and addressed him as Cobber. And of course, <laughs> Reg is from Leeds. Um, you also pretended you thought he was an interior decorator in order to remind him of Ted, who you knew to be his predecessor you were also sick over his shoes it was a terrible evening he hated you and obviously that is you know it's like i mean it couldn't be any more extreme of passive aggressiveness literally vomiting on yeah. on rage yeah. and of course throughout the play butley calls rage ted deliberately knowingly so again there's all these little um again you know i suppose little childish strategies that just are a are a kind of indirect way of trying to say what he really wants to say which as you said he's just he can't you know he, he pulls back from that um and he and he yeah again he tries to go at this kind of more dramatic you know way both i guess for for maybe for his own entertainment, but also to, to avoid the intimacy as well. I think maybe that's all going on, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it is for his own entertainment to some extent, because at least he can entertain himself if other people don't <laughs> do yep. that. But I think what is more the case uh, regarding Rage and, and Joey is that deep down he does not want Joey to leave the flat and he's going to feel desperately lonely. So he's not going to say that, but he's going to castigate and mock Rage in the hope that that he just becomes a figure of fun, that the that Joey could just see him as this ridiculous figure and will uh, move away from him, dump him, basically. That That is this sort of hope. And and again, the emotional immaturity and vulnerability comes out in that um, probably Butley is most ugly in this play is where he's mocking uh, Rage's uh, apparent working class origins, even though it turns out he, he wasn't from that background. That is him at his ugliest. But this is a man that knows how to shame others. And usually when people have that uh, great accuracy, in shaming others, that they are they're quite a victim of shame themselves. So I I do think that this is part of the game playing as well is to uh, shame others, uh, hide his actual feelings, but still achieve what he wants. 
See that, yeah, that's interesting because I, I was having a little bit of a, a dabble in uh, in Bern earlier on, mm-hmm. and he, he talks about what you know. He obviously, in this book, games people play it d- depicts all these different games that yeah. people play in social situations that, as you describe, avoid intimacy. And he talks about this game Blemish, which, which he describes as a game played when when the person playing it is in the position of a kind of depressive child. In other words, thinking that they're no good, but they're transforming this into a kind of aggressive parental mode, whereby they're trying to show that everybody else is actually no good you know and yeah. it, it, Bern describes this as offering a kind of like a negative kind of reassurance where if you make everybody else bad or worse than you then you don't need to feel so bad you know and it's it's kind of no. I suppose you know Butley you know it's quite um, explicit about seeing himself as a child actually you know it's like he, he really um, revels a bit in being in this child mode so I guess rather than taking the more adult move of actually you know trying to give him you know a, maybe a fairer a fairer view of himself both positive and negatively and, and similarly to others he's just in this kind of take people down a peg mode really yeah. here you know and it's just relentless really isn't it with a with reg in particular obviously culminating and provoking reg into punching him you know as the play as the play goes on but it's it's this as you say it maybe is the the most immature or the or the most dislikable side of him when he when he just goes at people in that way yeah i, I mean it it's not light. I mean, I think that's a good point, bringing up the Bern game of Blemish. And we could actually add that that's what Clemens was doing too. That was his game. In the fall, yeah, well. yeah, indeed, yeah. yep. That's of right. uh, making everybody else bad so that he could feel not so bad. And Butley's definitely doing that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the playfulness of Butley, it, it's uh, obviously if, if we were in the in the sensorious parental state, ego state, as they say in TA, we would say, we would look at playfulness as just immaturity, but that is obviously far too harsh because playfulness is connected to creativity as well. But we see in Butley a playfulness that can be both brilliantly creative and emotionally immature too. And, um, and I mean, we mustn't, when we speak about his emotional immaturity, we mustn't, uh, make out that uh, he is necessarily to blame for that. I, I don't think that he would. You could actually make the argument that if somebody is intellectually brilliant, it might actually make them emotionally stunted in some ways, uh, mainly because they could be alienated from others or find it harder to find the sort of uh, way of connecting that others might just do like a hand in a glove. So, yes, it, it yeah. might, uh, you know, we mustn't say that. Oh, he's immature. It's just a way of uh, of dismissing him. But no, I think you know. yeah, I think that's a very important point, actually. Um, and and I think um, the, the the play does quite a nice job of actually injecting a little bit of that nuance in as it goes on, because um, as you'll recall late, later in the play, where Reg and Butley have had their kind of big showdown, and uh, you know, Joey, as this has gone on, as as Butley's been more and more mocking, Joey actually starts to laugh. So there's this kind of sense yeah. that you know he's not actually entirely himself you know detached from well one from Butley's mindset or also necessarily completely allied with his new partner Reg and actually Reg himself then becomes a bit um he's obviously defensive and annoyed but he he does things like he, he demands that they're going to a football match that night which you know mm-hmm. Joey doesn't doesn't like football but Reg says what's yeah. the important game we're going and then he says something like oh you're gonna to have to outgrow this kind of stuff Joey and there's kind of subtle signs that he might be actually quite a controlling partner and maybe you know lack the playfulness uh, dimension yeah, you know at all so you know it's I think you're right it's not actually that Butley's condemned here and everybody else is kind of oh, elevated no. you know in that sense um, no, no not I at mean, all the, the playfulness isn't a vice per se of course it's just the no, no, a, it, matter it, of, it of isn't, degree isn't it, it? Isn't. Yeah, no, it isn't. I mean, obviously, when he's trying to shame others, as Bern would say, blemish them, that is an, an immature reaction. Uh, as Even if we see it in the most compassionate terms, which is there's a lot of pain, a lot of shame there. But you're absolutely right that Rage's pragmatic view of life, because this is a guy that deals with literature as a means to make a sale, so he's not again. Yeah, he's not. He's not connecting to literature intrinsically. It's. It's there to make him money. He is a very practical person and he pragmatic, and he also wants to, as Butley points out, uh, keep up a certain kind of appearance as well. And as you say, he could be controlling towards Joey. Um, 
and and you know the football stands in contrast to Elliot, which was the and poetry, which was the connection between Butley and and Joey, and and so yeah, they they're almost like opposites because Butley is this um, disillusioned idealist. He doesn't really know how to be effective in life, but he does have something of the stars. And but but Joey, um, sorry, Rage doesn't have that at all. But he is effective, even if we, effectiveness is not everything. So turning now to talk more specifically about some of the mental health insights that we might take away from Butley. Um, previously, Alec, you touched upon the idea that um, he's avoiding intimacy. Um, I'm wondering how much do you think his theatrics are are part of a kind of tendency towards just being inauthentic? Well, I mean, I'll quote the, the director, Harold Pinter, when he was uh, talking about his, his own plays that he saw communication as a stratagem to to cover nakedness. So in Pinter's plays, the characters are evasive because they, they want to cover their emotional nakedness. So I, I think that applies to Butler, and it might have been one of the reasons that Pinter actually directed this play. I know he was good friends with Simon Gray, the playwright, anyway, but he, mm-hmm. I, I think he was drawn to it thematically as well. And and I think with Butley, what we see is, um, I mean, if if we feel something very intensely and it's uh, a very vulnerable emotion, then we're almost condemned to be evasive because it, the others have got such a power over one. Um, it's not like feeling a little bit discomforted about what you're going to say or how you feel. It's a it's more an intense nakedness and. Um, and so the the evasiveness is an attempt to, as I said, achieve what he wants to achieve, but also maintain a degree of power and control, which a more direct expression of how he felt would seem like an abdication of power and control. So I think that the flurry of words is a way to try and dominate a situation, whereas if the words stopped and the more honest emotion was revealed it would be a very vulnerable, almost pitiful state, if, if you see so. what I mean. I think I think you're right there. Uh, yeah, I mean, for example, there's the scene where Butley kind of drifts off, he's with Joey, and, he, and he's mm. talking about his daughter and his marriage breaking down, and he gets a little bit more, you know, almost he's almost monologuing, slightly forgetting Joey's there, and he's getting a little bit more open, and he's, he then recites some lines of poetry, and then Joey mm. comes in with a question about something like, do you miss your daughter? And, mm. you know, Butley's response is then a sharp attack again on the issue. Yeah. Is he going to phone Reg and get himself invited to dinner? You know, it's immediately um, he comes back with a with a really sharp barb there. And I thought, and, and he, he does something similar again, actually, when, when Anne, his wife, comes in and tries to ask them something about about the relationship. And again, he just, he won't, yeah. even with her, he won't actually be open and vulnerable. So I think you're definitely right. There's a there's a need to keep, play, you know, reasserting power whenever he feels vulnerable on some level. And it's almost compulsive, actually. Yes. I think. Yeah. I mean, these are two good examples of, of what we're talking about. And uh, this is a character that is condemned to indirectness. He's condemned to indirectness because the more mundane expression of how he feels is so... Uh, well, he he would equate vulnerability with powerlessness. I think that's the main reason for his evasiveness is that he unfortunately, like so many people, sees vulnerability as, vul- as powerlessness and as weak. And so he evades it through the main strategy, stratagem, as Pinter would say, of his eloquence. Yep, indeed. Um, and, I mean- and, and, you know, when, when he's asked that, Ha, you know, humane, but rather mundane question, does he miss his daughter? He cannot engage on that level. And no. you could see why people would get annoyed with Butley because we we do want, you know, we want fascinating conversation. We want to 
uh, witty banter. We want thought-provoking points to get made. But we also need a diet of directness and of explicitness and and even yep. mundane statements. Well, I do miss her a lot. And if somebody can't really do that, they're very impaired in relationships. And um, dare I say, it, I'm going to say that they could become boring. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean... To me, Butley's kind of perversity uh, in that regard was was most was striking in the the scene where he's provoked this argument with Reg, you know, and he's provoked him and provoked him to the point that Reg then um, he reveals that he's publishing Tom's book, you know, so the, mm. the man that's taken up with Butley's wife, and Butley turned round to him and, and then t- Reg kind of insincerely apologises, and Butley says, "No, that was exactly the right move to make," you know, and he's almost admiring this wounding blow that's been made against him by this antagonist, you know, but he's created this situation needlessly, you know. I mean, it, it may be that they weren't ever likely to get on particularly well, but you know, he'd almost rather admire somebody getting a good blow in on him than actually just connect and or, or just talk honestly you know it's it's like it's that level of of power focus and and the the kind of interpersonal uh yes, realm that yeah, just uh, well, it seems very 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 unhealthy i guess yeah there is also that thing that if he was to admit his loneliness his difficulties there and how he wants to you know keep joey there it would just not seem right he knows that it just wouldn't seem appropriate wouldn't it and it's like it's part of his own self-deception i think getting so immersed in the game is a way of also forgetting what his real motivations are and that while they might be you could be sympathetic to them to, uh, to some extent they're they're obviously not overall uh moral motivations he should not be trying to stop joey from uh having this partnership no matter how lonely and alienated he feels. You're quite right. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, um, f- you know, finale to the play, really, isn't it? Where he's, you know, he has kind of orchestrated, clearly in a slightly drunken state, a, a situation where a new student that reminds him a bit of Joey has come yeah. to him for tutorials. And, you know, he, he ultimately sends the student away in quite a kind of, quite a cruel, caustic way. But it's like, it's like it's hit him at that moment that, you know this. This isn't. This isn't right. This isn't good. It's not good for him. How much he's he's interested actually in how how it is for the the student maybe isn't quite isn't quite clear there. But there's a, nope. there's a kind of you know it's like this. He's definitively lost that game in some sense by the end of it. This this isn't working, and he's just left himself. You know. Well, yeah. Um, that, I mean, that's a very good point, and and you know that because I'm a therapist, I'm addicted to spinning things in a positive light. <laughs> And I'll attempt to do it a little bit with that because, yeah, he has come to the end game of that game, the end point of that game. And and he has not, as you say, won that game. But he also maybe recognises that it's not about winning that and that he doesn't want to play that game now. Now, there is a suggestion that, that if he no longer has that game, then he's just going to be lying on the floor in a collapsed heap. Yes. Of utility, so there is that sense, and even even me as a therapist won't compulsively try and reframe that <laughs> as a positive thing. But what no, I, th- I think, I, sorry, sorry, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think the ending, you know, it's not an upbeat ending. That's for no, sure. I mean, there is no. a sense on the one hand he's he's recognised futility here, but there's not necessarily a sense that's going to lead to growth or improvement. Maybe no, actually I don't quite think the opposite. It is. I don't no, I don't think, think so, it no. is. I, I don't think it will lead to to growth because I don't think he knows how to move past that. He knows that the game isn't working anymore, but what the new game is going to be or whether it should even be a game, that's the thing. But, but the, the end of that game, because it ends with Mr. Gardner, this, this uh, student that comes in that is obviously uh, admiring him just as Joey did at one point. A student that admires his intellectual brilliance and um, he could have taken up with Mr. Gardner again, just as he did with Joey. But I think he recognises that on some level that uh, admiration is not enough. The admiration, maybe at one point he thought that admiration would become a more 
deep and loving connection between him and Joey. But now he sees that Joey is just as pragmatic as uh, as Rage is, really. He's now, in a sense, a disciple of Rage. Yeah. And, and because he made that transition so seamlessly, it makes you wonder how much the poetry and sensitivity and the discussions he had with Buckley really did penetrate him. And so yeah. the, there is that thing of, I could go down this route with Mr. Gardner, but I've seen this movie before, so to speak. And 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 it no longer interests them because the what he wanted ultimately was something more emotional, more a connection. And and he's recognized that that even these young people that admire him for his brilliance may not ultimately deliver that. Yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? I guess the uh, as we were talking previously, you know, this inability to just be more direct emotionally, more vulnerable, and just try to get a kind of connection on that basis. So obviously, it's difficult for him. But I mean, that the, the having taken this alternative game playing route to try to kind of um, dazzle, you know, these these admiring yeah. younger people with yeah. his talent and getting, you know, kind of yeah, admiration as that kind of substitute in a way for for love you know he's it's like he suddenly realized that just simply isn't going to work for him so well, what does no, he do now I mean, again yeah. it's again his dedication to joey and the mr gardeners is a form of evasiveness i mean if he because he wasn't going to reach out in that more direct and candid way he was more seduced by being admired but yeah. being admired you could end up just becoming um, yesterday's news. You know, the person's moved on to a new disciple, so to speak, which is, uh, in the case of Joey, it's Reg. The final question we were going to talk about in terms of the mental health aspects particularly was how can the Butley trap be avoided? You know, for, for people who are maybe more intellectual, sensitive nature and so on, how do they avoid slipping into these kind of nihilistic or self-destructive ways of being? <clears throat> well, I, I, I'm going to tie this a little bit to, to the philosopher Schopenhauer and his essays because I was reading them recently and as you know, Stephen, um, the way that Schopenhauer speaks about human beings in general is not uh, you know, too complimentary. Certainly not, and, no. And while, while he, he was a brilliant man, Schopenhauer, just as Butley is as well, um, and it's not as though he's not without his uh, insightful point by any means, but where I think they're kind of united is that they didn't have enough humility uh, both are almost intoxicated, maybe Schopenhauer more than Butler, but both of them are intoxicated by their brilliance and they don't seem to have appreciated that you could be brilliant in one direction, but in other ways have a lot to catch up with, even maybe with some people that are rather ordinary in that way. And so I think that if you are a sensitive soul, that is something to... Um, you know, be proud of and to cultivate it, but never, uh, but to have the humility to recognize that that doesn't mean to say that there are other parts of your nature that you have to work on. And uh, rather than think that because you're brilliant, that you're superior to everyone, and then any problems you have are other people at fault. It's a sign of how, well, I remember reading the, the Schopenhauer essays, and he, he puts in italics uh, how vulgar most people are, something that he wants to, to emphasise, but he didn't seem to recognise that that could be uh, a sign of his own immaturity in some ways yeah i mean this yeah i think that's that's absolutely spot on and it slightly reminds me again of our conversation a couple of weeks ago about the about the fall and the character clements you know who yeah. who is using a sense of superiority to bolster his fragile ego and it's like the same strategy that, that i guess would be more tempting for people who are more naturally intellectual and you know that there's they're going to be sharper than others and so there's that there's that i suppose that little temptation there to use that to feel superior and thus they therefore minimise their own responsibility or their, or, you know, the other aspects of their character that maybe aren't as strong. So, yeah, it's like um, there is a there is definitely a, a trap there for, for, for that kind of person that maybe... Um, well, there is. A key thing we've got to, to look at here about not falling into the Butley trap is that um, he did not use his gifts 
to cultivate and nurture other people. There's Well, in the main, obviously we hear with Joey that he did do that, but there was also that element of uh, no doubt looking for admiration, I think, in that case. So it wasn't maybe quite as altruistic as what it could. But if you're a sensitive, very bright soul, you can use those gifts to help everyone else, or help others at least. And that is part of not falling into that nihilistic, despairing pit of futility that, that Butley has fallen into. In a way, he's too self-conscious to be giving. Yeah, I think that I think you're absolutely right. Um, I was thinking as well, I mean, obviously the, the, the relationships in his life and the failure, as you said, to be more you know, loving and actually think more about what he can give rather than what he's needing um, or where it's gone horribly wrong. Um, I wonder as well if, if there's, you know, there's a part of him that isn't being quite honest enough with himself. Um, I mean, for example, it's intimated that he's married Anne. Um, you know, they've yeah. had this short, disastrous marriage. And it's it's kind of intimated that, in a sense, it was, you know, maybe like an, an attempt by him to see if a heterosexual relationship would work for him. Um, and it's like she's come to the realisation that he really isn't heterosexual. It doesn't seem to be. And that that has, you know, that has really led to this this situation, maybe that's not the only factor, um, but you know this situation where they're both now estranged from each other, um, and I, obviously I, I'm aware that the um, the play was, I think, homosexuality had only been legalised maybe four or five years again before the mm-hmm. before that play was written. So that you know, there's there's maybe a kind of complicating societal factor at play here as well for Butley in terms of his own self acceptance about his sexuality. Um, and I just yeah. wondered, you know, he. Um, he obviously in his in his uh, showdown with Reg is you know has thrown all these kind of um, yeah. prejudicial terms about mm. homosexuality mm. at Reg to try and undermine him. Knowing full well actually these same terms could be thrown at him, but it, you know maybe Reg isn't sure about that. So it's like he's playing upon that kind of prejudice that he knows is, is in the air, um, which certainly was more, more so at that time particularly. So um, I wondered whether, yeah. the, you know, a lack of honesty in that way about his own um, sexuality and what he's looking for in relationships has also maybe crept in and, and soured everything yeah. for him here. Um, yeah, no, I, I would agree with you that um, he does use the, the homophobic insults of the time to demean yeah. rage, but but it does seem that his attachment to to Joey is not simply platonic, so there is a a lack of authenticity there. But as you say, it's uh, understandable up to a point given the period in yes. which Butley is living, uh, late sixties, early seventies, that uh, societal acceptance would not be anywhere near as much as today, and so. Yeah, it's probably Butley has a degree of shame over that and his own internalised homophobia then redirects at rage, but in a yep. in an ironic way to try and win over a joy. To win over, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the, yeah, there is yeah. that aspect. And and I think that's, again, about the game playing and evasiveness, that that this is a, a man that, that uh, probably does love his flatmate, but can't really say it directly. Um uh, it, it's interesting that a character that was um, this uh, literature academic is actually more inhibited than the, the pragmatist Reg that's the publisher, who is embraced and, or at least um, is open about his sexuality. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that, that, that Butley, who's the more cultured one, is, is less... Um, open about it you're quite right yeah that that's right i mean he, he is you know despite his uh you know his you know poetic professions he is an extremely guarded uh man emotionally well, he and is. he's, he's he is. not and i think that is perhaps you know the, the his number one um mistake really isn't it that this kind of you know avoidance of intimacy this this failure to really yeah, yeah. i mean the one possible reading of the play, if we were to read it from a sexuality perspective, is that he probably felt compelled to marry, to marry a woman. And that did not work out for him. Uh, as his wife, own wife says to him, uh, you found out what you needed to find out. Yeah. And that could be, or it could at least be read as an intimation that... Uh, that he didn't actually want a woman 
Yeah, um, I think and, so. And yeah. the, you know, the, the protests he makes over Joey are more vehement than over his wife. And um, so it's quite likely that this was a gay man that thought, that, that had that uh, conformist side, which is, is particularly understandable given the time, yeah. where he probably tried out heterosexual marriage as an experiment. But uh, as she said, he found out what he needed to find out. And, um, and, but yeah, it's and, not, and it's, it's not, focus on Joey. Sorry, yeah. But yeah, it's not clear if he has found that out um what route he's going to take in the future you know it's i mean obviously the the, the culmination is that his relationships are all in ruins with everybody yeah and, uh, he's, well he's, the, the th- you know the thing is that this is a man that whether he was in a heterosexual relationship or a gay relationship still has the same problem with intimacy yes. and for the one of the things that might be quite tragic for him is that if he is actually gay uh given that he has that internalized homophobia to some extent that means that he's going to be even more evasive uh with uh, with a joey or another man really so it, it, it's 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 a layer upon layer of difficulty for him yeah i think so um and i you know that this is uh you know with butley's long long-winded spiels and his dramatics you know it's it's he's like the most kind of extreme case of that really that I, i've ever come across yes. um, yeah a I, I guess case study a, a, well indeed um so maybe a final a final uh question to end on would be just what for you in this play um alec what would be what do you think would be the most memorable aspect of it what 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 does what do you think stays with you and um, when it comes to butley yeah, I, I mean, for me as a person, I, I think that when I was watching Butley, it's that connection between um, having a deep passion for other people and the envy that that, that can come that can come with that. Um, I would say that that was something that that I could identify with when watching the play. Um, that's something that I would share with Butley and it's almost like a, a weakness that comes with that strength um, really yeah. that the, the more unfortunately the more you want to deeply connect with certain people the more then that you're open to that painful envy as well it's something that you have to learn to move past ideally i'm not meaning an envy in an, an iago sort of way no no Nothing no, no like that i, did, of course, I didn't but think I just, you like iago yeah no i didn't no no i mean you know i might cultivate that with time i don't know but um but no i'm not but i just mean that um thing of envy and uh, as you know because you've studied these personality typings there's the enneagram and type fours are known as the artists but they're also the envy type because yep. they have this this sense of perceived lack and the the envy others and also their passion makes them more open to to envy we see that with sally airy as well in amadeus um so that yep. was something that i could say on a personal level i was able to resonate uh with butley uh there that that it was yeah. uh, that was one of the things that affected me emotionally anyway yeah i mean that that's interesting yeah i mean obviously yeah you could um yeah, I guess you you know you mentioned the the type fours on the enneagram. You know the mm. the, uh, the the kind of more you know deep sea divers, as they're sometimes mm. nicknamed. You know, and it's yeah, I think I think that's that's what it is with Butler, isn't it? You mentioned before that kind of person, maybe maybe academia isn't their natural home precisely because of this strong feeling. You know, when they're in such a kind of cerebral realm you know it's yeah. so much and and you know also a, a world where as we've discussed you know a bit of you know grit and conscientiousness and knuckling down is also very much very important to 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 um to, to well yes on. so he's yeah he's maybe more of an artist really you know he's maybe that's that's maybe he's obviously true a, you know and, and and spiritually speaking you know maybe not necessarily in terms of what he could plausibly do, but maybe, yeah, maybe that's that's where uh, it's the it's the maybe the stifling lack of creativity that about the environment that's been you know part of yeah. the problem. Although as as we've discussed, you know, it's it's much more is. complicated than that. But I but think yeah, he is uh, more an artist in a way. And and one just one last point I want to make about envy is that because 
envy is obviously admiring some qualities in other people that you would like to have or seeing a relationship that you would like to have. But the thing about envy is that it's, it's got this sort of fantasy that you could almost introject, as they say, in psychoanalysis, you know, take it in. So it's got almost a passivity to it. Envy can also be a, a sign of a passive life because people that are more active and actualized in themselves, as Maslow would say, would be less likely to feel envy because envy is quite a passive emotion, as Spinoza would put it as well. Yeah, that's a great point. I suppose in the you know the the deficiency needs you know if if somebody has kind of risen above those to some extent by their fulfilment and they're in the the B realm as Maslow called it, then yeah, envy isn't so likely to intrude there. You know if they're no. in a more kind of purposeful state, but it's the, I think so. it's more at the yeah, yeah the lapse level. Um, final. So I guess a For, final point I would I would make about it is um, so I would very much recommend um, that our uh, our listeners do check out the the Alan Bates um, performance. Of, of Butley, you know, directed by Harold Pinter, which there will be links to in the show notes. And my, um, I th- one of the things I think I, I take away from this play, having seen it a few times, is, is just the absolutely brilliant performance that Alan Bates um, puts in as Butley. I mean, he's such a fantastic actor, or he was such a fantastic actor. Mm. You know, he's obviously been in, you know, Chekhov and Shakespeare and all the, all the great stuff. And he is a, you know, he, he brings this character to life. Uh, and, and you know an incredibly powerful way he really gets the I, I suspect Alan Bates was probably a type 4 as well um, if we talk about you know really getting this character deeply and you know expressing him uh, in such a kind of nuanced yeah. way um, so, I mean it was a brilliant performance from Bates and we, we know now and we've known for a while but probably not at the time unless I'm mistaken is that Bates himself was bisexual Okay. so um and it sounds yeah. as though he might have had a period in his active life where that was kept private. So, yeah, I wonder if that added layers to him playing Butley. Yeah, I do wonder. Certainly, um, he really is living the character. I mean, there's, it's yeah. just, you know, the, the acting is absolutely first, you know, first class. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so a, a great performance of a great play. And, uh, yeah, yes, thank you yeah. for thank you for your, your thoughts there tonight, Thanks Alan. for I that, that as was well, a very Stephen. An interesting conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. Thank you.